Well, good morning. Good thank morning. You, thank you for having me here. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, after I <laughs> talked to Reverend Marsha and said, yes, I'll be happy to speak on the 10th. It's like, oh my gosh, January 11th is my very first senior exam. <laughs> what am I doing? What should I be doing? <laughs> but it's been perfect because the things I've learned for myself in this talk are going to help me on my exam tomorrow. <laughs> In the Centers for Spiritual Living, we go through ministerial training. And so this is my fourth year of ministerial training. Um, and for the next six weeks, each Monday, um, for two and a half hours, I will be doing a senior exam on different topics. Tomorrow I'm talking about on examining on religion. And then um, there's education, there's leadership, there's science and spirituality, philosophy. Um, psychology, so it's very extensive what we get tested on, um, and this exam has to be proctored and all this stuff, so it's a lot of pressure, and I have just been feeling more and more at peace, now I have had days when I've had little meltdowns, but it's getting there, so I just invite you to know that divine mind is in me, it's in each one of us. And the next six Mondays, everything I need to know from Divine Mind is right there, coming forth, flowing forth through me. So thank you for knowing that with me. Today I am talking on the way it works. And as Marcia said, in Centers for Spiritual Living, many ministers will go back this first month of the year and back to the basics, kind of. And what are the first four chapters in the Science of Mind textbook? And this is really the basis of the whole philosophy of science of mind. And so last week would be the thing itself. What is the thing itself? And that to me is Ernest's way of saying it's God. But so many people have a lot of baggage around that word God because of religions we grew up in, things that people told us. And so, Ernest said, it really doesn't matter what you call God. Spirit, divine intelligence. I like to call it the universe. Ernest said, it doesn't matter if you call it potato. <laughs> it doesn't change the nature of God, of spirit, of the one power, the essence, the creative ability that's always going on. And it lives in and through every one of us. Now, this is January, so happy 2016. Do you know where the name January came from? Oh, hey, I've got some people that can read. That's exciting. <laughs> it's named after the Roman god Janus. And the Roman god Janus, as you may be able to tell here, has two faces. One face looks forward into the future. The other face looks backwards into the past. And I think that is so neat because isn't that what many of us do in January? We look at where are we going this year? What resolutions do we want to set? For me, it's more what intentions do I set for this year? Resolutions don't always work for me, but I can set intentions for where I'm headed and what I want with my life. And I can also look back and say, what's worked in the past? And what hasn't worked so well? And what do I need to give up? Because now my life is different. This is a brand new day. I've never lived this day before. And so, wow, how can I create my life? Aggie, I love that reading that you just did from Ernest because it's talking all about we're the ones that are responsible for creating our life. So if you haven't gotten that message from being here at Centers for Spiritual Living Palm Beaches, let me just give you that message today. We are the creative power of the universe. We are God in action, and we are responsible for our own lives. Did you hear her read that this morning? And that's the whole crux of our philosophy here, is that we create our own Existence. We create our own reality. And so it's however we choose to see things. Are we going to look at things that said, ooh, that didn't work? But 
But you know, that's the way my family always did it, so that's how I'm going to do it. And we march into the future, dragging all of that with us. Or are we going to say, hey, I'm realizing that I'm a powerful person. That I am one with spirit, with the creative power of the universe, the infinite intelligence, and I can create my life just as I want it. And when we recognize that, we are powerful. So as we look back to the basics there, let me give you just a little reading from Science of Mind textbook that kind of sums all that up. This is on page 26, and it's the first chapter, the thing itself is titled. And this, Ernest says here, the study of science of mind, wouldn't that be good if we knew what that was? The study of science of mind is a study of first cause, spirit, mind, or that invisible essence, that ultimate stuff, the intelligence from which everything comes, the power back of creation, the thing itself. And so to me, that's Ernest's way of saying, it's God. But so many people have baggage with God that let's just call it the thing itself. Infinite intelligence, creative power, the universe, whatever works for you. Now, if I can get my slides to move. Yes, it worked. All right. So my first point here is that we need to recognize that God is all there is. I've had a teacher tell me, Either you believe God is all there is, or you don't. And when she says that sometimes, I look at her and think, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And so I'm learning. God is all there is. And when we look for God in each other, when we look for God in all kinds of circumstances, when we see God in nature, now replace the word God with love. When we see love in each other, when we see compassion in each other, when we see joy in nature, we're seeing the spirit. We're seeing that divine essence. And when we see that everywhere, that God or spirit is all there is, then we can know that we are one with it. And if we're one with that, Recognize that that creative power is right within us and it is moving through us and from us. <coughs> so this is the difference in science of mind philosophy and traditional Christianity. Science of mind says, spirit, God, the universe is within me. I am made of God's stuff. God is all there is. Christianity would say, God is here in heaven, you're a lowly sinner, you have to beg to forgiveness, and then you go to heaven. <laughs> Science of mind says, we don't believe that we are separate from God. God is here within and all around us. And when we get that, when we truly get that, we are powerful beings. Because anything that we want to see that's for the good of all will manifest, will come to be in our lives. So how do we know that God is all there is? I can tell you that, but, you know, Ernest said, don't believe what somebody else tells you. You have to test it out for yourself. And some of our beliefs are kind of hard to give up, aren't they? We just came through Thanksgiving and Christmas time, and that always takes us back, or takes me back, I should speak for myself, to you know family celebrations and what my family said and what my family did. And sometimes that doesn't work for me anymore. And so it's creating my life like I want it to. So God is all there is, and I am one with it. 
Let me offer you this analogy. How about water? To me, water is a great analogy for spirit, for God, because water comes in many different forms. Now, we have drinking water somewhere. Marshall was so kind to give me a little water. So we have water. We have ice. Some people like water in their ice in their water, and others don't. We have steam. You make your coffee, and don't you have steam coming out of the coffee pot? You boil the water for your tea, and there's steam there. Some mornings you get up, and there might be fog outside. Well, that's water. We have rain. Thank goodness we don't have snow. I can give up that part. <laughs> because that's all water in the atmosphere. Our bodies are 93% water. So that's why we're always needing to drink and stay hydrated. Because our cells have so much water in them. God is everywhere. And water is everywhere to me. But doesn't it come in different forms? Here we have ice, we have liquid water, and we have water as a gas in the clouds. Think about that as spirit, as God, as the one presence, one power. But it can look different, can it? To a Muslim who is praying, and kneeling on the floor and touching their head to the floor three times, that's their God. I may not relate to that God, but can I say that's not God? Oh, that's not God. No, it is. To the Buddhist, who will sit quiet in meditation, that is their God. To the Pentecostal, who wants to get up and jump and run and be filled with the Spirit and filled with joy. That's still God. It's all different forms of Spirit. And just because it doesn't look like what I'm used to or what I'm comfortable with, it's the water without the ice, it doesn't mean that it's not still Spirit. So to me, that analogy really opens me up to how open am I to different people and to allowing God to show up in different ways. And you know, sometimes the least, the way you least expect spirit to show up is just how it shows up because it's all God. And either we believe it's all God or we don't. So sometimes we can stop and recognize that person that's in our face, that's really irritating our last nerve, they're God too. So can you see how water can be a good analogy for God? The ultimate presence, the power of all. Science of Mind textbook, chapter 2, is the way it works. And Ernest starts here by reminding us that everything is the one thing. Now sometimes the way Ernest says stuff is a little confusing to me. When I first started studying Science of Mind, it's like, why can't he just say it and be through with it? But he'll say it, and then he'll say it five other ways in a little different language, and I'm still confused about what he's trying to say. But the more I stick with it, the more I start to understand. Here's the gem. And then I also learn that I take what's right for me, what resonates for me, and that's what I can use. So in the Science of Mind textbook, page 36, Ernest says, and don't laugh, this can be a little confusing. There is spirit, or this invisible cause, and nothing, out of which all things are made. Now spirit plus nothing leaves spirit only. Hence, there is one original cause, and nothing out of which we are made. 
In other words, we are made from this thing. That is why we are called sons of God. So what that says to me is, it's all God. It's all God. And nothing. Nothing else. It's all God. So if it's all God, and we were made from this, we're made from God. Does that make sense? Pretty easy when you step back and look at it from that sense. When I first read that, there's God and there's nothing, and then there's, you know, this is what you made, we're made from, and it's first cause, and it's like, what? It's all God, and there's nothing else. So, science of mind says it's all God. There is not God and the devil. There is not God and another power that are fighting for control. It's all God. So when we recognize that it's all God, we have nothing to fear. Now, let me give you a little disclaimer here, because I like to try to be practical. And I was confused about this for a while. People in Science of Mind will stand up and they'll say this and great stuff like it's all God. And I'm thinking, well, what about this disease? Is this God? Well, what about this person that just shot these people? Is this God? Either you believe that God is all there is, or you don't. So what I've had to see is there is a perfection and that perfection is on the spiritual plane. There is a physical plane that we live in as well. And the physical plane may have things that don't look so pretty. That doesn't mean that it's not all God. But we need to keep in mind we are spiritual beings on a spiritual path. And so as we live and walk and move our spiritual path, then we create within our minds the physical plane that we want to see. And when the disease comes, when the diagnosis happens, we look for the good that's there. And we'll find that good. God doesn't always look the same. Because God is infinite. Spirit is very um, diverse in so many ways that it looks. Our second point is to listen. Listen to ourselves and what we're saying, both verbally and non-verbally. So if we say, hmm, Rick told me this morning, God is all there is. But, hmm, I don't really think that's true. Or what about this? So listen to what your mind is telling you. And as you listen, then you begin to see where am I? Why is my life showing up like it is? And what can I do different? Remembering that spirit has many, many forms. And we believe that God is all there is. There is spirit and nothing, as Ernest said. We're each individual individualizations of this one spirit and one power. And Ernest says that we're made out of this one spirit and power. So therefore, we are all part of God. And that's what makes us powerful beings. And the way God shows up can be different for each one of us. And we have a lot of different opportunities to express spirit. Let me read you a letter to God. There was once a little boy who wrote a letter to God. A postal worker found the envelope and addressed it addressed to God in a child's handwriting. He opened it and read the letter. Dear God, my daddy has been sick and we have no money to pay the rent and buy food. Please send us $500. Your friend, Tommy. The postman was so touched that he took the letter to his fellow postal workers and it created an opportunity for them to give to this cause. Within a week, they had raised $300. 
He put the $300 in an envelope and delivered it to the boy's house. Two days later, another letter addressed to God arrived at the post office. This letter read, Dear God, thank you very much for the $300. But next time, would you send the money directly to us? If you send it through the post office, they deduct $200. <laughs> <laughs> What was that little boy's belief? His belief was God was going to provide just what he asked for. So listen to what our beliefs are. Listen to what our mind is saying. And are we believing that we can really get and have what we want? What we're asking for? Our last point here is to train our mind. And this is what we're constantly doing, is working to train our minds so that we can see the good in all that's going on. So we can see God working and living and having its expression and being through us. How do we train our minds? Well, we have practitioners here. And when you meet with a practitioner, they know your highest and best. You may see all the circumstances going on, but they know your spiritual perfection. Am I right, Heidi? Yes. And you will remember that for people, and they will declare that, and that lifts us up. Reverend Marsha is always offering classes here. She has new classes forming now. So taking a class is a way to train our mind, to get a new view, to expand our view of God. Affirmations. I'm big on creating affirmations for myself and repeating them, posting them at my desk, putting them in the car, wherever I will see them so that I remind myself of the good that's there in my life. Meditations. Spending time in meditation. Spending time in prayer. It's all ways that we train our minds so that we know and see what it is that we want to see in life. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Ernest Holmes said the same thing in different words. Ernest said, we're bound by nothing except belief. So what do we believe for our lives? What are we looking for and what do we expect to see show up each day? I want to end with a final story. There was a village in China, and this village came under attack. Actually, that's the end of the story. There was this village in China, and this village had a large clay Buddha, and they were very proud of their clay Buddha, and they would come around the Buddha. Um, it was under a shade tree. Well the powers that be decided that the road was going to come through this village and they had to move the Buddha or they were going to destroy it. So they brought in big cranes and they lifted up this humongous Buddha and they moved it to another area and set it down. They covered it with a tarp and during the first night after the move, one of the monks said, woke up in the middle of the night and said, I need to go check on the Buddha. And so he went out in the dark with his flashlight and he raised up the cover, the tarp that was on the Buddha, and started shining his light and walking around and checking the Buddha. And all of a sudden there was something shiny reflecting back to him. He's like, what is that? What's going on? And there was a crack in the clay of the Buddha. And he thought, well, that's odd. What is inside there that's so shiny? So he went and got a screwdriver and he started to dig at the crack. And as he dug more, he began to reveal that what was there underneath the clay Buddha was really a golden Buddha. When the town had come under attack, the monks had gotten together and covered their golden Buddha with clay so that the people that were pillaging the town would not take their golden Buddha. 
They thought it was just a nasty old clay Buddha and left it. And now, years later, they're discovering this Buddha. I want you to know that you are the golden Buddha. Whatever beliefs you have that have covered the clay, have made the clay to cover your divine inside, doesn't matter. You can give up the things that don't work for you anymore. You are the Buddha. You are the golden Buddha. You are the prize of God. You are one with spirit. And in that oneness, you have life, you have power, and you have joy. So I am knowing for each one of you a happy, a joyous, prosperous, and exciting 2016. Bless you.